Today we're joined by Matt Barron of Simon Barron Development, Seth Pinsky of RxR Realty, and Kenneth Weisenberg of Eisner Amper. Gentlemen, welcome to ProofCap today. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So we're talking about investing in real estate and in particular investing in the city of the future. So what do we need to understand about the way that cities are changing such that we make the best long-term uh, real estate investments? Why don't we start with a question for Matt. You know, what are some risks of, of, for investors investing long-term capital if they don't really understand the way that cities are developing uh, over the long term? You know, I always start with the tenant of, you know, location, location. And, you know, when you're looking at that, for us, we're very focused on sort of transit hubs and proximity to transportation as we as we invest around sort of central business districts like obviously like New York City. So, you know, long term if we're talking about how cities are growing, I think understanding how that transportation landscape is changing and the kinds of access to transportation that people are going to have. We um, are, are heavily focused on trying to explore the relationship between transportation networks and affordability actually. Um, one of the big challenges that New York faces today is how you accommodate a growing population, growing workforce in a city in which it's very hard to develop. And a uh, not surprising result of all of that has been that in core and prime neighborhoods, you've seen the costs escalating because supply is having a hard time keeping pace with demand. The question that we're asking now is that as the subway system, which has its limits, is reaching capacity, and also as people are beginning to get near the end of subway lines, where else is there for people to go? And so one of the things that we've been exploring very closely is the suburban transit lines. Um, and what we found is that in many older suburban communities, you see downtowns that feel very much like outer borough neighborhoods. Uh, Seth, briefly, talk about your uh, professional background because you, you're, you've seen sort of city development from a, a slightly different angle, right? Sure. So uh, before joining RxR, where I've been for the last four years, I was uh, with the Bloomberg administration uh, at the Economic Development Corporation for 10 years, working for the last five years as the president. And so as a result of that, um, I've had the, uh, the good fortune of being able to look at uh, development projects from both the public and private side. It's not just transportation, it's also technology. You have self-driving cars um, on the horizon. Uh, that's going to be probably as big a change as the iPhone was um, to the way we live and work. You're going to see more people telecommuting, uh, less of a need to be in the central um, business area, uh, people doing meetings on Skype. It's, it's changing the way we, th we think about work, changing our space needs for work. So we're seeing a lot of trends kind of coming together, um, drawing the very, very rich into the center of the city um, and pushing the working person further out. What you're seeing is that there's so much pressure being put on prime areas that the only way to address that is through density. But at the same time, you have people in these communities who legitimately are saying that they don't want the character of their community changed on a wholesale basis. And so the question is how you square that circle. And transportation really is the only option that we have. And the way I like to think about it is today what we're trying to do is squeeze 10 100 story buildings into a limited area. Whereas if we were to invest more in our transit infrastructure, we'd instead be able to build 100 10 story buildings, which is a lot easier to do. As investors, how do you two uh, conduct due diligence to a point where you feel like you have a good handle on the ability for people li living in a certain area to, to get around and whether or not uh, their access from one point to another is going to improve or whether it's it's not. First thing we, we like to do when we go in, whenever we go into a new neighborhood is we try to we try the transportation out ourselves. It, it, it's interesting. We're building a, a, a very large building right now in Long Island City. We're building a half million square foot rental building that sits right on top of the train. Um, and the proximity to Manhattan is absolutely tremendous. It's I think we're three minutes to Midtown. We're something like seven or eight minutes to uh, to Times Square. It sounds kind of silly, but the first one is you you got to kind of live it feel it a little bit yourself before you start to look at just the, the analytical data. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, it's, it's about spending time in any given location, walking the street, talking to people, um, and then you know, taking the transportation network yourself. And you have to really do it. It's not just going once and saying, OK, I saw it was a 25-minute trip. It's, you have to do it repeatedly um, because what you learn is, OK, it's a 25-minute trip when everything's working, but it's, geez, it seems like one out of every three times the train is broken or whatever. And that tells you something important. Um, I think also um, just 
staying current on what's happening in the region, reading uh, blogs, reading news sources um, is an important part of it because um, you not only need to understand what's happening, but also need to understand what policymakers are doing and how that's going to change what's happening going forward. So for example, there is an investment thesis that says that Philadelphia, given an improved transportation outlook, could become more like a suburb of New York, if, again, if there's more like high-speed rail service to uh, New York. And yet, if that doesn't materialize, it is not a suburb of New York. It is, it is Philadelphia. Yeah, I mean, all, all I know is my grandfather in the 1950s was buying property on 2nd Avenue for the 2nd Avenue subway. <laughs> He's dead, and 40 years later, it finally opens. So I don't know. I think, again, I think so he, he was right. He was just a little, little early. A little premature. Right, right. Yeah. Talk about Philadelphia. Is Philadelphia seeing a boom on its own right? But the commute from Philadelphia is about an hour and 15 minutes. I live in, in northern Westchester, where the commute is about an hour and five minutes. So even today, Philadelphia is it's an expensive commute, but it's commutable. And by the way, I think that that's a, a great um, point to make. It's really not about distance in terms of miles. It's about time. And that's how people judge whether they're proximate to a location. OK, let's uh, try to wrap our heads around um, a, a technology that's quite different from rail, which is driverless cars. If you imagine a city that is you know, swarming with driverless cars, what real estate will be uh, required? I think the first thing that comes to mind is, sort of, is parking, right? I mean, you look at parking garages, and parking garages over the years have been disappearing you know, throughout the city. If the driverless car technology expands the way people are talking about it expanding, where it, it makes owning a car let, unnecessary, Right, because or or you you own your car, but but it can basically act as an Uber while you're at work, and then take you back home. You start to lose the need for for parking garages, and those that can become effectively obsolete real estate. Even Uber has changed the way people think about owning a car in the city, because you can rent a car for a day if you need to go out to the country or something like that. That's right. For just gener generally getting around, you know, you pop on your phone. There's Uber in you know, five, five minutes tops. Again, we built a building in Long Island City seven years ago that was a 160,000 foot building. We had a 15,000 square foot parking garage that we leased out to an operator. And when we, when we came back to ask him, hey, how many of our tenants you know, leased, leased a, a, a parking spot? I think it was like one or two tenants. And we said, we said but the garage is always full. Who's, who's parking in the garage? He said, well, people that are commuting in from Flushing, people that are commuting in from Long Island, they're coming in, they're parking here because it's half the price of the city. They're taking the train one stop. I guess parking is a huge issue for people with fairly substantial commutes. They're parking at the train station. And actually having a driverless car take them, you know, whatever, the 15-minute drive from their suburban home to the train station would be a, a game changer. And the reason why our train stations, among others, has, have historically been surrounded by uh, very little density is that you need to accommodate parking. Um, and if you could reduce the parking requirement there, development would become much easier, and you could begin to resettle people in denser, more transit-friendly ways in the suburbs, just like we have in the outer boroughs and elsewhere in the city.